Good morning, everybody. Welcome to MGBC. We're glad to have you with us today, um, the Sunday before Christmas. So it's packed on the floor. That's awesome. Um, we're starting uh, this morning with our fourth week of Advent. So, Logan, if you could drop the lights and roll that video, that'd be great. Let's just redo that because it's a silent movie. Dusty, turn the gain up on that channel. Let's try it again. We're professionals here. Is that Paul Clawson? Knew it. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. Few would have considered it a silent night, a holy night. Travelers jostled in the city gates. Weary fists pounded on closed doors, pleading on the outside, arguing from within, all to the same refrain, no room. Among the houses rang raucous Roman laughter, census takers with comfortable quarters and plenty of food and wine. There is little peace and less goodwill between stranger and villager here. Somewhere a dog barked, a lamb bleated, a woman moaned, and a baby cried. Out on the hillsides, exposed to the cold night, without even a stable for warmth, shepherds huddled around the fire, guarding their flocks against thieves and wolves. Suddenly, a light to split the darkness, a voice a song, a chorus of angels. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a child, a son, a shepherd, a king, a savior which is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to men. Awaken, O little town that cannot sleep. Hear the shepherd's words. The angel's message. And arise to a sound unfamiliar. The triumph of joy. stand together and let's sing about that joy as we sing the song joy to the world you can bring the lights back up please logan um we have a little bit of a remix to this song and actually the choir doesn't even know this is coming we're going to teach it to you it's really easy there's three words to the remix and it's joy 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 so we'll teach it to you right now it goes like this joy joy joy
to ask you to stay standing. We're going to sing one more Christmas song before we meet and greet each other. Just want to be a little more traditional. searched all over town, but there was no room to be found. The night was here, they had no place to stay. The inn was full, and yet I couldn't turn them away. It wasn't much, I told them so, a humble bed in from the cold. One 
I'm just a simple man. Please understand, I have no wealth to give. It was just a cattle stall, a bed of straw, where no child should have to live. But he needed shelter. Any place to lay his head. So I gave the babe from heaven. Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. It's great to see all of you out there with all the red and green. Some of you have some pretty flashy ties on. Uh, make sure that you compliment those. There's quite a few of them floating around out there. Uh, I would like to welcome you. And if you are a visitor with us this morning or a guest, would you please fill out one of the cards in the pew rack in front of you? Just put your name on there, a little bit of information. We just want to get a record of your visit and then send you a letter of thanks for having you here to worship with us here at Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church this morning. Starting a new, is, I don't, do you call this a series, Ryan, or just a new, new part of the service? We're going to have youth leaders coming up to do youth announcements uh, one, you might listen a little bit more when it's a youth leader giving an announcement, but most importantly, it's all about getting to know who the youth leaders are. 
So we have Brian Berkheimer here this morning. He's going to tell us what's going on with youth and some of the announcements that they have. Looking for my paper. Looking for your paper? If I don't find it, it's going to be, oh, there it is. It's going to be the shortest <laughs> announcement segment This ever. is one of the things you get when you have youth leaders coming up here. You just <laughs> kind of like, so I'll fill in so you got to look. Okay, you're all set then. All right. Uh, first thing, we had our mystery meal last night um, over at the Shoop Lodge in Saxton. And we had close to 100 kids there, so it was really successful. We want to thank... Becky, Floretta, and Brant, Lighty for planning all that, and all the everyone that helped cook and serve. It was it was awesome. Kind of disgusting at times, but it was it was pretty fun. <laughs> um, we had the Ben Smith fundraiser Wednesday. If we raised a, over three hundred dollars, the top five amounts got to take a swipe at his head with clippers. We raised five hundred eighty dollars. So Ben's got a new haircut. You have to check that out. Where is he? Is Ben here? Um, where's, where's Ben? Moms, it look all right? Good, looks good. Okay, all right, good. I was going to have him stand, but he's pretty tall. You can see him. Um, winter jam and winter retreat. The money is going to be due for both of those events when we come back after the holiday. We're not going to meet until then. That's, so we're going to beat this to death in these next couple weeks so that we don't have any kids that are left out because they didn't hear the announcement. Um, winter jams, Friday the 16th. Cost is twenty dollars. That's ten dollars for the ticket and ten dollars because we take charter buses, so it's a lot more comfortable and easy on all us adults. Um, and you can give that money to Laura Ritchie. And a winter retreat in Camp Manawagon this year is Friday the well Friday to Sunday, January twenty third to twenty fifth, and the cost is fifty dollars for that. Again, money's due January seventh, and you can give that to Chris Brooks. And if you're gonna send your kids to both of those events, we ask you pay for them with separate checks so we can track it. Um, that's it. Thank good. you. All right. Very good. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Again, this is Brian Berkheimer. Just so you know, he's one of the youth leaders, one of the youth leaders. Wheels of Joy. Well, you couldn't come in here this morning without seeing the Wheels of Joy program in full swing. All the bikes, gifts, packages out back. Some of them are up here in front of the worship center, the Wheels of Joy program. The dinner will be held tonight for those that are picking up their gifts. Uh, there'll be a dinner downstairs in the fellowship hall, and they'll be picking their gifts up afterwards. For those of you that are providing child care or assisting as um, those individuals that will uh, host the tables, we would ask that you would be here at 515 tonight. 515 if you're working with child care or if you're hosting tables, so 515. If you have any questions about that, see Jason or Jen Butler. Jason or Jen Butler can answer your questions with regards to the Wheels of Joy program tonight. Thank you to all of you that have contributed, bought gifts, provided uh, money. Uh, we just thank you for a great program. There were 38 bikes that were assembled by a crew of inmates from the Federal Correctional Facility up at Loretto on Thursday. They assembled the bikes, put them all together. Uh, some of you may or may not be aware we were given a donation of 500 toys that were not picked up from Toys for Tots, so we incorporated those. Some of those toys went to Living Hope. Some went to Through Incorporated. Uh, there was another area that they went to. Well, some went to, to uh, our people here. But uh, thank you for the Toys for Tots folks that donated those 500 toys. We greatly appreciate that. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve this Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Please remember, arrive early because it gets very, very crowded. We'll have multiple overflow areas should we need them. But it will get very crowded on Christmas Eve, 7 o'clock. Arrive early. If you can and you are able to, please park up at the park and walk down to save parking close to the facility. Uh, some of the folks need to, be, to park closer to the, uh, to the worship center. So if you are able, please park up at the park and walk down. And one final note, we will be using live candles, okay? Uh, well, is there such thing as a live candle? I guess you can have it, like, just like a little flashing one. So it'll actually be a real flame. So we don't want any of those in the hands of children under 10. We'll have glow sticks for them. So if the live flame, please keep those in the hands of those 10 years of age or older. Uh, there are some other important announcements in your bulletin. A uh, fundraiser for Tim Edmondson, a missions trip to Urban Hope, a winter archery league, all of those details can be found in, in your bulletin. <coughs> A new attender luncheon, Sunday, January the 18th, 12 o'clock, following the Sunday school hour. If you are a new attender to MGBC in 2014, you should have received a letter this week. 
You should have received a letter this week welcome you and giving you an invitation to the new attender luncheon on January the 18th. If you did not and you are a new attender, you can still come. Contact Rachel at the church office. If you didn't fill out one of those pew cards, then you may not have gotten an invitation. That's why those pew cards are so important. So if you did not, please give us a call and let us know that you would like to attend. Uh, as you know, last Sunday... Uh, Tim Park was here as a candidate for the pastor of Family Life and Discipleship. According to our Policies and Procedures Manual, we are to vote the following week, which would be this Sunday. So, Randy Huntsman, if you are here, if you would come on up, he is going to take us very briefly through the process of the vote. Thank you. Turn that on. Hopefully. Yeah, so at this time we will uh, be conducting uh, a vote as to whether or not to call Pastor Tim uh, here as our family life and discipleship pastor. So if you are a voting member of Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church, that is if you are 15 years of age or older and you are a member of this church, would you please stand and the ushers will pass ballots out and please remain standing until you actually have your ballot. Once you have your ballot, you may be seated. And the ballot reads, please indicate below whether or not you wish to extend a call to Pastor Tim Park as full-time <coughs> pastor of Family Life and Discipleship of the Martinsburg Grace Brethren Church. And you can indicate your vote below. And once you have received your ballot and you uh, cast your vote, please just fold the ballot one time and then pass it toward the center. Um, and then uh, the ushers will come and pick them up. Okay, gentlemen, if you could, and whenever you get a chance, you can come and uh, gather up the ballots. And If you uh, got missed getting them picked up, just hold them up, and that way they can see them. Um, Rachel, we need to run more ballots, please. Thank you. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Thank you very much. Offering envelopes are available in the table out by the information desk. So if you're looking to pick up your offering envelopes for 2015, they're available alphabetically out on the table out by the information desk. So please make sure you pick that up before you go. And if the ushers are free from picking up ballots... <laughs> Go ahead and collect back there for, for a moment. We're going to take the offering. Remember, there are two offering uh, opportunities this morning. 
Uh, the, the first offering will be for uh, a regular. Shirley, do you want the first offering for regular? First offering, regular? Okay, the first offering is the regular offering. The second offering will come through again for the birthday for Jesus. Our birthday for Jesus. We'll be taking that offering this week, and you'll have an opportunity again next week. Then remember, there are three different organizations that you can contribute to. You can contribute to Through Incorporated in East Freedom. That's our local offering opportunity. You can also contribute to Urban Hope, the inner city mission and ministry program in inner city Philadelphia. And you can also uh, uh, give uh, your money to the um, Baikal Rice Mill in the Philippines. So you can choose each one of those. Remember, the first offering is our regular offering. And the second offering coming through will be the birthday for Jesus. Please, 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 please indicate on your envelope which you want those offerings to go to. If you do not indicate, we'll just divide it up in thirds and send it to all three of the areas. So please, if you want your offering to go to one of those specific ministries, make sure you indicate that on your envelope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time of year. We thank you for your son. We thank you for all that you have provided, and now an opportunity to give back a portion of what you have given to us, Father. We bless, pray that you will bless this offering, that it will go to the ministry of the gospel in our community. Father, help us to be mindful of those that are approaching this holiday season that are apart from loved ones. Perhaps in the past year, uh, a loved one has passed away. Perhaps they're in the military or just unable to get home uh, this Christmas season. I pray a blessing upon those families. Uh, I pray peace and comfort to them. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Doing things a little bit differently this morning. The children have a lot to get done at Children's Church, so this time we're going to dismiss the kids for Children's Church. Sorry to throw the loop at you last second. Don't run over the ushers. Oh, which way? Did we pick a door to go out? They go out that way? Go out that way. Also, don't run over the orchestra stuff. And once the plates get to the back, we'll stand together. Um, but let's sing the song more than enough.
Father, it is well with our soul because of the Son that you sent, the Son whose birth we celebrate this season. Father, the Son that came as an infant, grew into a man, and then gave his life for our sin. Father, we thank you and praise you for the plan that you put into place. The Son that came as a baby will one day return as King as Lord of Lords, to rule this earth, Father. We ask your blessing upon us this morning. Shape our hearts and our minds. Move us in the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, it certainly is a great time of year. Family gatherings, parties, celebrations, gift giving. Thank you. You're welcome. Colors, decorations. By the way, the sanctuary looks beautiful. Thank you to those that take the time and contribute to the decorating of the worship center. It looks absolutely beautiful. We appreciate your efforts in making it a fest, giving it a festive look. While the season is so exciting and filled with laughter and fun and joy, there remains a great deal of darkness in our world. You don't have to look far, just look back at the headlines this past week in the news. One would be tempted to argue that there isn't a whole lot of peace on earth. Six killed in a shooting spree in Philadelphia. Sydney, Australia, 17 people taken hostage, three die as police storm coffee shop. Taliban fighters kill 141 people at a school in Pakistan, 132 of them children. Then you came to church today, perhaps you looked at the cover of the bulletin and read the passage there from Revelation chapter 12. I don't mean to put a damper on your holiday celebration, but it's not a pretty world in which we live. But this is the same world that Jesus was born into. Jesus, God in human flesh, chose to leave glory and splendor to come and live like we live. He chose to obey the will of his Father and come to earth and live as we do in a world just like we live in today. But around this time of year, we forget, we want to forget about all the reality of the world. We like to stick our heads in the sands for three or four weeks and choose to look at only the neat, the clean, the tidy, the orderly, the peaceful, pretty lights, parties, presents for family, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. For a few days, we just want to focus on the good in everyone and forget about the ugly, the dirty, and the sinful. Pastor Tim talked last week about how we have cleaned up the manger scene, how we've tidied up the birth of Christ. He talked about seeing Jesus wrapped in a nice warm blanket, all clean, no mess. Mary and Joseph, just has, Mary has just given childbirth and she's bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, totally at peace. Clean straw on which the child lays, no smells from the barn, no flies or potential infection around the baby. Wise men coming and bringing gifts from afar for the poor family. Joseph probably thinking this is going to give him a nice jump start on his new carpentry shop. We forget the fact that, by the way, there's no mention that there were three wise men that we have so neatly organized in our culture. We don't know how many wise men came. We created that idea. And also that those wise men weren't actually at the manger scene. They came later, perhaps months or even a year or so later. So my intent this morning is to look at the messy side of Christmas, the side that you probably won't read Christmas Eve if to your family out of the Scripture. We like to read Luke's account on Christmas Eve, don't we? Because if you read Matthew's account, you've got to read about the messiness. You've got to read about the sinfulness. 
You've got to read about a murderous rampage. So we stick to Luke, and we like to read that for Christmas Eve. It's because of this mess, though, that makes the birth of Christ so beautiful. You see, it's the blackness of Christmas that we come to realize the beauty of the Christ child. Jesus is born of a virgin. That in itself sounds nice, neat, has a pure feel to it. It's kind of clean and wholesome and untainted sounding. But let's not forget there's a deeper story behind this birth to a virgin. Mary is engaged to Joseph. So it appears as though Mary has cheated on Joseph and committed adultery. In essence, she's violated her husband and the marriage vows that she will shortly take with her husband. Mary, after learning she is pregnant, leaves town for three months. Don't think the rumor mill in Nazareth and Bethlehem wasn't cranking then as she darts off to be with her cousin. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Mary to return home? She's visibly pregnant, walking through the village, through the streets, everyone staring at her, jokes, harassing her, teasing her relentlessly. As she would walk through the city gates, she could hear them mocking. She could hear the possible threats of her being stoned in fulfillment of the law. It's not a pretty side to Christmas, is it? Initially, Mary would worry about the instability. See, the angel came to her and promised her a child, but he never promised her a husband to help her raise the child. Mary's thinking she's got to raise this child all by herself. No man's going to want her. She's damaged goods. Her reputation is destroyed. So Mary's thinking she has to raise this baby all by herself. It's not until Joseph has a dream and the angel comes to him and says, it's okay, take Mary as your wife, it's all right. Mary will become Joseph's wife. She would then have peace with respect to this. You think it's going to be easy raising a child in that day and age? Imagine you're raising a child in that day and age and the child is the very son of the Most High God. How about that for a parenting challenge for you? We don't often think about that. I mean, how do you, do you need to discipline the Son of God? If he never sins, do you have to paddle? Do you have to set a curfew? I don't know. Those are all things that maybe Mary's thinking through. Even after the birth of the child, it wouldn't be easy for Mary and Joseph. The young parents took Jesus to the temple on the eighth day to be circumcised, circumcised as according to Jewish law. Take a look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. If you're using the Pew Bibles there in front of you, page 557. 557. Luke chapter 2. Starting in verse 28. Luke chapter 2, verse 28. So they take the child to the temple. Simeon has waited the long arrival of the Messiah. Mary and Joseph bring the infant child Jesus to him. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, verse 29, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what, he had, what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. A sword will pierce your own soul too. Simeon has waited a long time to see the Messiah. He blesses the infant child, then turns to his mother and tells her, a sword will pierce your own soul too. What did he say? Joseph says to Mary, Mary, did did you catch that? I don't quite understand. What did he say? A sword will pierce my own soul too, Mary says. She and Joseph are confused. Did they know the kind of death that the Messiah child would suffer? 
save his people from their sins, but he said nothing about crucifixion. It's a picture of what is to come for Mary. She will see her son suffer a horrific death on the cross as her Savior and ours. After getting the bad news, the couple returns home and they get some welcome visitors from the Magi. They come to visit, bringing gifts to the Messiah child. Finally, a bright spot in the Christmas story, but not so fast. Shortly after their departure, Joseph has a dream. Let's look at the dream. Turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. That's on page 523 in your pew Bible. Matthew chapter 2. Starting in verse 13, page 523. When they had gone, that's the Magi, they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up and took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt. I call my son. Jesus and his family flee from Herod. The angel tells Joseph to gather his new family together and to run, to flee to Egypt. Herod wants to dispose of the child. He wants to rid the world of this ruler, the one that would be supreme. Jesus, Mary, Joseph are on the run. Jesus, an infant is a wanted man. This trip to Egypt is probably several months or even a year or two after the birth of Christ. So Joseph gets up from sleep, packs his family together, and heads south to Egypt. Not knowing which child would be the king, Herod massacres the innocent children of Bethlehem in the surrounding area in an effort to protect his future, in an effort to rid the world of the future King Jesus. Let's continue on in verse 16 of the same passage. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. In accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Herod is threatened by the announcement of this new king. Jesus has been safely shuffled off to Egypt. And evil intended to rid the world of the Messiah fails. Satan has been foiled again. This fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy, the birth of Jesus, is not the only fulfillment of prophecy... But it was a plan of God from the beginning. Flip back all the way to Genesis chapter 3. First book of your Bible, Genesis chapter 3, page 2 in the Pew Bible. (coughs) Starting in verse 14, Genesis 3, verse 14. Adam and Eve have sinned, and a curse is going to be placed upon them by God. In verse 14, so the Lord God said to the serpent, to Satan, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Here's the critical verse. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The offspring of woman, Christ, will be the enemy of Satan. Back in Genesis, it was the plan of God to reconcile us back to God the Father through the birth of a child. This passage speaks forward to the event that we celebrate this week, the birth of Christ. But it's covered in ugliness, sin, and death. While the passage tells of a coming child... It speaks of enemies and striking at the heel of Christ. You see, Christ would be crucified, 
That's what the passage is talking about, striking at his heel. But the passage goes on to say that Satan's head will be crushed. That is, Satan will ultimately lose as Christ is resurrected from the dead. The dark side of Christmas. Now, turn to the book of Revelation. The book of the apocalypse. The end of all time. The end of things as we know it. Revelation chapter 12. Page 668 in the Pew Bible, 668. <clears throat> As I said, the book of the Revelation deals with the apocalypse, the end of all things, the end of the world. But remember, a few weeks ago I told you that's not the primary theme of the book. The primary theme of the book of the Revelation is the majesty, glory of Jesus Christ. That's what the book is focused upon. Yes, while it does point towards end time prophetic announcements, the purpose of the book is to point us towards Jesus Christ. Here in John's vision, we see the Christmas story from a different perspective. In Revelation 12, we see the Christmas story kind of behind the scenes. We get to pull the curtain open and look backstage to see what's going on, to look beyond the beautiful manger, the child, the gifts, the star, the angelic hosts, and all of those things of the Christmas story that we love so much. We get to look behind the scenes to the ugly side of Christmas. You see, Christmas is really about a war between God and Satan. And while we clean it up a little bit at this time of year, it'll be much more thrilling and much more beautiful to us when we understand the purpose of what was to occur. Revelation 12, verses 1 through 2. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Remember, the book of Revelation has many symbols to it. Notice that John sees this as a great and wondrous sign. This vision that John has is of a pivotal world event. The woman here has 12 stars on her head, symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel. She, the woman, represents the nation of Israel, and out of that nation they will give birth, birth to a child, to a woman named Mary. Mary is giving birth to the king, Jesus, here in this passage. That's what John sees. That's what he sees in this revelation. Let's continue on, verse 3. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. The dragon here represents Satan, he is powerful. He has multiple crowns and multiple heads, and his tail swipes a third of the stars from the sky. Mind you, just a third. He doesn't have complete power. He's waiting for the nation of Israel, Mary, to give birth to this special child. Do you see the cosmic view of the nativity here? Do you see behind the scenes what's going on? Satan is behind Herod's scheme to kill Jesus. He is the one that is killing the innocence of Bethlehem. Satan has always tried to destroy, destroy Christ. From Herod to Judas to the Jewish leaders to the Roman authorities. It's always been his goal to destroy the Christ child. Continue, uh, verse 5. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Satan has no power over this birth of a new king, one who will rule with justice and power and righteousness and integrity and majesty. The passage says that the child was snatched up. This refers to the resurrection of Christ. Yes, Satan, you will strike his heel, but in his resurrection he will crush your head. Satan thought that he had finally won. He had defeated Christ. <clears throat> Death had been brought to the Messiah. 
but he lost through the resurrection of God the Father. We often hear people talk about the real meaning of Christmas. Many people who think they know the reason for the season, oftentimes they don't. To fully understand the reason for the season, we must first see the dark side of Christmas. So what do we see from all this? In fact, with all this in mind, what makes the Christmas story so beautiful anyway? I mean, we've got a young teenager socially scorned, a young family fleeing for its life, and a murderous, rampaging man trying to keep his grip on power. What's so beautiful about all that? Again, we see what's going on behind the scenes. We see an epic step of the continuation of God's plan. God has put his plan in place to win us back, all the way back in Genesis. And what we see here now is, through a baby, a major pivotal step in God's plan. A child of God the Father. It would be his son. A son that would be perfect. A son that would provide the forgiveness of our sins. The child would be the final step in the reconciliation of a sinful man to a perfect God. Christmas is beautiful because it is the first shot of the war. John Eldred says, Christmas is an invasion, the kingdom of God striking at the heart of the kingdom of darkness. The birth of Jesus marks the first cannon blast of God upon evil and Satan in the most ironic of ways, a baby. But the child would need to be protected so that the plan could continue. God will go to great lengths in order to keep the plan of redemption moving forward, God is and always has been actively engaged and moving through our world. He's connected with our lives. He's connected with Mary's lives and Joseph's life and the baby's life. And he's intimately involved. When Mary doubts as to who will come alongside her to raise this child, God intervenes and provides a vision through angels to Joseph. When Herod's military men begin to move upon the village of Bethlehem, God moves the family to Egypt in protecting them with safety. When the angry mobs are upset of the, by the new teachings of this Jesus Christ and they sought to seize him and throw him off of a cliff, he's divinely protected by God the Father. God has always been and always will be actively involved in their lives and your lives. It's only when the fullness of the time had come that Jesus, under the will of his Father, would willingly lay down his life and permit himself to be crucified. God would no longer protect him. In fact, God would turn his face from his Son. The sun would grow dark. The earth would shake and vibrate. The darkness of Christmas. It's here we see the purpose of God's plan, though, in the Christ child. We see an attack upon the very foundation of sin with the birth of Jesus. It is, in fact, the first hammer strike into the coffin of Satan. Isn't it beautiful? It's amazing. The nativity is the beginning of the end for Satan. The process, the plan that has been put in place all along is now beginning to take fulfillment. We have the arrival of the Christ child. The victor, the king, is now here. In the midst of an evil and cruel world, a baby comes. A baby that will one day rid the world of darkness. You see, the beauty of Christmas must always be seen in relationship to the darkness. Because when we understand the darkness and the world in which we live, and we see the brightness of Christ... That gives us true appreciation for the reason for the season. Three days following the turning of the face of God on his son, he would raise him from the dead, and the final hammer strike is in the coffin. Satan has lost. The Christmas story is way more than a virgin and a baby in a manger. Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men try to take it by force. There is a dark side to Christmas. 
The war between good and evil, between God and Satan, begins to pick up intensity with the arrival of the Messiah. It's on officially, as they say. But the beauty in the story is how the light of the baby Jesus pierces the darkness, exposes evil, and gives us hope in the final destruction of Satan and a restoration of peace. You see, it puts, sin puts us at war with God. But we find the peacemaker arrives at Christmas time. My hope is that you'll see Christmas as one of full of light and peace and hope and joy by a baby, by a perfect baby, by the Son of God. But you will see this from the point of view that a child was given, a child, the child, that will be able to take away the sins of this world would be able to burden his shoulders with the sins of this world. A viewpoint that takes you behind the scenes to see the war God is waging upon sin and death through the baby Jesus. A war in which the baby is ultimately victorious. And that's why we celebrate Christmas. That's the reason for the season. Let's take one last look backstage behind the beauty of the baby and the virgin and the manger. Back to Revelation 12 to conclude. Starting in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he, Satan, was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and with his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him. How? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury. Why? Because he knows that his time is short. The war in heaven rages on, but Satan is not strong enough. He's hurled down. Salvation has come through a baby, through the blood eventually shed by this baby. He is defeated. But while the heavens rejoice, we live in a world of death, violence, broken marriages, abuse, perversions, and wickedness because the devil has gone down and is filled with fury. Take heart. The baby that we celebrate, his name is Emmanuel. God with us. To be with us means on our side. Jesus is on our side. He's got our backs. And that is cause to celebrate. For unto us a child is born. Would you please run that video, please? And dim the light. But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He will be despised and rejected. He will be pierced for your transgressions. He will be opposed and afflicted, led like a lamb to the slaughter. He will pour out his life unto death. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. And by his wounds, you will be healed. Pastor Brian just said, sin puts us at war with God, um, but Jesus has come 
to put us at peace with him. Uh, obviously, that puts a whole new perspective on Christmas. A lot of times we like to say that, you know, Jesus is the reason for the season. Jesus is the best Christmas gift, and that's true. Um, but when you think about most gifts that we get on Christmas, it's a want. It's something that we want. I want that bike. I want that new video game. I guess I'm an adult now. I should want more adult things. But we treat him as a want, and, and that's not what it is at all. We need Jesus. We need him to put us at peace with God um, so we can live with him eternally. So as we stand, let's stand together, and we're going to sing the song, Lord, I Need You. Um, and I want to have that perspective as we sing it. Jesus isn't this want, something that makes us feel nice this time of year, and then we just put him back on the shelf, wait till Easter. Jesus, we, we need him. He's a need, um, and we should treat him like that, and let's worship him together with that perspective.
my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Father, we need you. We needed the baby, continue to need the baby, the child that would give his life child that would come and reconcile us with you through his death, burial, resurrection. Father, I'd ask that you would be with us this holiday season, be with our families. May we see the beauty, the peace, the hope, the wonder of Christ because what he achieved in the midst of the darkness. Father, help us to keep our eyes focused on him. We pray a blessing upon each family here Guide us and direct us as we go. In thy name we pray. Amen. Before you are dismissed, um, the vote was 190 yes, 27 no, for a percentage of 88%. So we will contact um, Pastor Tim and extend a call for him uh, this afternoon. So thank you for your participation in that. So it was an 88% vote. Thank you very much. You are dismissed.